I want to say before I begin um, how grateful I am to be here this evening uh, at TED, how grateful I am to be here in Nashville and to be alive. Uh, I mean that from the bottom of my heart, and so I really appreciate this opportunity to come and talk to you tonight. I know somebody said to me in the, uh, in the green room, or the makeshift green room, said, so what are you going to speak about? And I said, well, it's called The Upside of Cancer. And she went, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but what I want to talk to you tonight, and, and I'm sorry, I've got, I go out and speak around the country about systemic and institutional racism. Um, about white privilege, about the ways in which, and I speak mostly to those of us who are classified as white, about ways in which we may be unconscious um, about the way race plays a part in our lives bigger than, than we like to think about it. So I go out and do a lot of talking, I make films, and I write about these issues all the time. And I never have one of these. But they told me I was going to talk about myself, and I said, i got to have something. So I am two years in remission, two years and one month from stage four uterine cancer. Thank you. Thank you. And I have two years and 11 months left to play the chemo brain card. So that's what I'm doing with this. Um, I'm here today because I want to talk about something that I'm obsessed with uh, as of late. I want to talk about alchemy and healing. Um, it is something that is on my mind 24-7 from the time I get up from the time I go to bed right now. And alchemy, as you know, alchemy is the transmutation of base metals into gold. With fire, heat, you can take the base metals, the base metals of your life, the crap, all the things that happen. And I'm so curious how we as human beings, how everyone in this room today could actually be up here and probably tell a story that would lead and, and lead us to the alchemy that takes place in their life every day. Um, and that's basically what I want to talk to you about, how the worst thing that has ever happened to you can turn out to be gold. And how is that possible? And I know that there might be something in this next 16 and a half minutes that I say that's going to touch you and maybe make you think about transmutating some base metal, some bad thing that's happened that we call bad into gold. Before Two and a half years ago, I had a little bit of a reputation as being a firebrand. Some people call me a rabble rouser. Um, I had one friend say, you know, you're not happy unless you make two people mad by noon. Um, and that's, that's probably not far from the truth. Um, whether it was healthcare, systemic and institutional racism, racism in criminal justice, um, poverty, there were, I was always on top of an issue, the death penalty. And there was uh, something that was moving through me that I had never identified, but it just made me want to get up in the morning and make some kind of change or fight somebody or fight something, fight a system. And about two and a half years ago, well actually it would be three years ago this spring, things started kind of slowing down for me. Something, I, I wasn't feeling well, and I'd probably had about six or eight months of not feeling well, and I'm not going to bore you with the symptoms or, or, or even you know, make anyone queasy. But there was a lot that wasn't right, and it started reflecting in the rest of my life. Work dried up. Um, I was having more confrontations. Um, I just wasn't feeling myself. And I knew something was wrong, and I uh, was in New York City on CNN on the Paula Zahn show. And I will never forget, it was my last appearance on um, major network television. Um, and I was there to talk about uh, racism, and I was there to talk about self-segregation. 
And that show was more like a mud wrestling match for made Jerry Springer look like Mother Teresa. I mean, it was just a really uncomfortable environment. But I got very, very sick while I was there. And when I came back from that show in the spring, it seemed like everything came to a standstill. And I became very unhappy. And there are probably only five people total that I've ever told this story to. And well, after today, there will probably be about 405 people. Um, but I decided that I would share this because I think that is part of this persona that I cultivated for years of being a warrior and feeling like I could take it on. It was like I was selling this bill of goods that I was stronger than God. And as things began to deteriorate and I felt my life unraveling, I became very, very depressed. And there was a night, I had a doctor's appointment the next morning, and they were about to tell me what the next phase of, of looking into what was wrong with me. And um, I decided that rather than go through any more, that I was going to kill myself. And I wasn't just, it wasn't a passing fancy. I had the doctor's appointment, I deliberately was going to buy, I was going to tell them that I wasn't sleeping so I could get some more Ambien. I was trying to figure out how I was going to do this. Now, this is very bizarre because in the midst of deciding that I wanted to kill myself, as I was figuring it, I was like, okay, if I take the Ambien, do I need to have Jack Daniels? Oh, I hate Jack Daniels. Um, uh, what, what is, oh, I can't stand vodka unless it's cranberry juice. So I guess I could do it cosmopolitan. Anyway, I was trying to figure out how to make this enjoyable. Um, and I, once I decided on I was going to make a shaker of cosmopolitans, then, and now this is really crazy, I decided I, I was going to go to the Shelby Bridge. And I went to the, I was going to go to the Shelby Bridge, I was going to have some Cosmopolitans, and I was going to take the Ambien and time it out right. But then, I didn't want to get a DWI driving to Shelby Bridge. <laughs> so, you see the insanity in here. I'm wanting to, I'm wanting to check out, but not under unsavory circumstances. So I'm laying there, and I am planning all of this, and just as I am about to drift off to sleep, I hear a voice that as fast as anything said, you have cancer, and you need to figure out what you're going to do about it. And I, well, I was like, where in the world did that come from? Never had occurred to me that anything like that was possible. I mean, it just wasn't even feasible, never even entered my mind. And I shook it off fairly quickly because that was obviously something that was just, that was my depression speaking. So the next morning, I went to the doctor's office and I was all ready to tell him my story about how I couldn't sleep, which, is, which was not untrue. And I was in the dressing gown waiting for the doctor. And when he came in, he came in and he sat across from me and I'm sitting in and the women in the room know, you're sitting in the dressing gown on that table with your legs over vulnerable as all get out, and he came in and sat across from me, and um, he put his head down, and I knew, and he looked up at me and he said, I'm so sorry, you have cancer. Now, at that moment, something shot through me and out my mouth is, I want to live, 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 I want to live. And at the same time, the other voice is coming in going, oh my God, I can't afford to have cancer. My health care, this is going to kill me. And I went back and forth, my God, I can't afford to be sick. And I told him, I can't, no, no, this can't be, I can't, I, I can't afford to be sick. And then the next thing was, oh my God, I want to live, I want to live. Am I going to lose my hair? My God, I had fabulous hair, I must say so myself. I had fabulous, curly, long hair, and it was one of those things that, you know, all women, everyone, we attach ourselves to one of our features that's sort of our favorites. That was mine. And so I asked him, am I going to lose my hair? Am I going to... And then I realized I might lose my life because he said it was pretty rapidly advancing and we won't know until we get in how far it's gone. So we went through an emergency radical hysterectomy. 
I didn't have time to think about it. I didn't have time to, to grieve. I had always thought I would have children. This took care of that. I don't have to make that decision anymore. So I went and had the surgery. And it turns out it was stage four. And, um, and I was going to need chemo and radiation possibly at the same time. Now, the interesting thing about getting a diagnosis of cancer, when you pride yourself uh, as someone who is a warrior and you've cultivated this persona so everybody else thinks you are too, um, that you want to buck up and sort of wear it in a way. But the interesting thing is the phone started ringing and the phone calls came in. It was like, that's impossible. You can't, no, you can't. That, that, that's crazy. You're doing all this work around healthcare. You made that film about healthcare. This is just insane. The interesting thing is everybody in the world was calling me and telling me this was impossible and this was wrong. And in the quietest moments right after it happened, I realized this was perfect. This was absolutely supposed to happen to me. And I don't know why I thought it, but I thought it was perfect. I never, ever felt why me. So the warrior became chemo girl. And I was scared, and I was terrified. I was terrified I was going to lose my house. I was terrified that I might lose my life. And part of that is in due to I have some friends who were cancer research scientists at Vanderbilt. And they did the favor of coming to my house. And God loved them. I loved them both. They're both Italian, don't know each other. And very separately, they reviewed my pathology report and said, oh, Molly, this is bad. This is very bad. Very, oh, my, oh, my goodness, this is bad. And so I went back and forth between being scared for my life and absolutely certain that this was for me. This opportunity was brought to me for a specific purpose. And I didn't really understand why I felt that, but I did. And so it was in those, it was in the chemo moments, that heat where the transmutation can occur, the heat of chemo, where people who no longer walk this earth came to my bed. And it seems that I spoke to everyone I've ever met who I've loved and who has passed away came and spoke to me. And my friends thought that it was the drugs and it was the pain pills and whatever else I was on, that that's what I was, and it, I tell you, it is the most real thing that's ever happened to me. And not only were there people that no longer walk this earth, but anyone that I had had a conflict with that was unresolved, that was left over, that hung somewhere inside me, they showed up. Now, there were nights where it probably seemed pretty bizarre. I remember one night I was laying there, and a friend of mine called on the phone, and she was telling me she was on her way down Broadway. And I said, oh my god, it's you. And she said, what? I said, is that you coming through the scarves? And about two seconds later, she called my sister's phone and said, what the hell is going on over there? But those moments, even though they seemed like they were hallucinations or re responses, those moments were the most real, the most truth. I call that my Leonard Cohen period. Because <laughs> I felt like I was about six feet under the earth and just seeing the world because there is a immobilization, there is a flattening that happens when you're going through chemo and radiation. You open your veins to poison so that it can come in and almost kill you, but not quite. And so I began to experience a vulnerability that I never had ever experienced before. And what happened was I lost my hair. I lost my crowning glory, so I thought, and, of course, I was drawn and pale, and I weighed 103 pounds. And so what happened was I would go out, and people would look at me, and they would use that voice. You know that voice you use on somebody? You go, how are you? You know, like I'm 103. And but, it, but what happened was I realized 
that the vulnerability that showed up in me, in my state, was a gift to other people. That that vulnerability that was reflected back to them allowed them to be vulnerable to me. And I got to see some people for the very first time. And I had friends who did a fundraiser for me. You know, again, I was chemo girl. I was, for the first time, I mean, I had, people were taking care of me left and right, bringing me food. Thank God I had a lot of friends. I have a lot of friends. And many of you are here today, and this is probably the first time ever I've had the opportunity to thank you. Thank you. There's so many of you here, and I know you are. And I wanted to just say that that is healing. The prayers and the love and the benefit and all of that was part of the healing process. It was part of the repair. It wasn't just getting the chemo. In fact, the chemo, the chemo is what I was fighting because what I learned from this experience was that I didn't fight cancer. All those things that people said to me, you're such a fighter, you're such a good fighter. You don't fight cancer. I didn't fight cancer. I listened to cancer. Cancer spoke to me. It told me what and who I was and where I was hanging on and where I was sad. And it spoke to me about the, the grief beneath the grievance. All the grievances, all of the, the um, retaliation, all of the ways in which I objected out in the world, I realized that there was some grief under there. And so chemo and radiation and that whole process of recovery was not just a physical healing. It was a spiritual, emotional, almost a planetary healing from where I was sitting. And there were people that behaved in a way and looked at me, as I said. People were sending me money that I knew didn't like me. <laughs> Honest to God. I got a check one day and about fell over for 50 bucks from somebody I would swear to you hates my guts. <laughs> and, but it was the beautiful thing about it is I realized that it was that exchange, that was healing right there. That that person got to offer something to someone that they might have had feelings about and didn't even realize. So my story about chemo and cancer isn't what most people think. And I don't, I don't want to put this on anyone else because there are people in this room that have experienced, there are people that are married to people, have children that have, it's different for everyone. This is just what it was and is for me. And one of the things that I just want to offer this up for anyone who hasn't or known anyone, but the last thing you want to tell somebody that's in chemo or has been diagnosed is about your friend that just died a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> You can, you can hang on to that. <laughs> so the vulnerability that I found in this experience was my strength. I had it all upside down. I remember my mother calling me one time, 2001, I had been at the World Conference Against Racism, and Time Magazine captured me in the air going, reparations now! And my mouth was open and my mom goes, were you in Time Magazine? And, but that picture of that that was strength, that that was fighting, that that was who I was and to find out that that was nothing to do with the real strength. And so what I want to ask everyone here today is, what is your moment, your personal moment of alchemy and healing? What is that thing that takes you to the edge that looks like the worst thing that's ever happened, but it's really speaking to you? So are you listening or are you fighting it? Thank you very much. <laughs>